Good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church. We're happy that you all are here this morning and praying you're feeling well and feeling blessed. And well, today we have a treat. Um, Randy is gone. That's not the treat, but <laughs> we pray for Randy, and uh, he is he is visiting family um, down in Florida. There's a wedding. So we pray for him and his safe travels. But Michael Hopper is going to be speaking to us and in his place. So be in prayer for Michael as he as he shares God's word with us. So very, very excited about that. Well, connection groups. I just want to talk a little bit about connection groups. Uh, 2020 was difficult. And praise God that we were still able to connect with one another through our online worship and through our online connection groups. And that has been a really big blessing. And so I, now we, we're, we have more connection groups now that things are more open and we have uh, several connection groups that are starting back. And so we have our Sunday morning, you know, what we know as Sunday school. We have the anchors class. They are meeting in person now. And, of course, we have the Seekers class, and, and praise God for Jerry and his leadership all, through, all throughout. That is incredible. We have the New Testament class, and they are meeting now, so praise God for that. And then we have our Works in Progress class, and these are all the adult classes that we have available right after this worship service. So we encourage you to get plugged in. You can still you know, wear your mask, be social distance, and be safe. Um, and so we do encourage you to, to take part and, and connect with one another as we connect to God together. So I encourage you to um, just plan on it. After, after worship on Sunday morning, just go to a connection group, and, um, and that would be awesome. Well, let us continue our worship. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you, to praise you. Dear Lord, we, we thank you for all that you have given us and, and especially for the sacrifice that, that you gave your son for us that we may have everlasting life. We thank you for everything you've given us. And also, dear Lord, we, we pray that we will use what we hear today from Michael to apply it to our lives. Bless those that are here and bless those that are not able to attend. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing together now the hymn, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old Oh, 
As we continue to worship this morning, we want to take a time to pray together for each other and with each other about the good and the bad that's going on in each of our lives. So does anyone this morning have any prayer requests or praises to share with us? And Kelly will walk around with a mic so that you can share with everyone. My daughter, Beth Ann, she got the uh, tube inserted in her stomach area to get hooked up to dialysis. And she's taken the classes now to learn how to use it. So hopefully in the next week or so, she'll go on dialysis. But she's sitting with her dad this morning so I can come down here. But she still needs all your prayers. First, I want you to remember Neil. He has his surgery Wednesday. And another thing, I talked to Paulina Giltner yesterday, and she and two other people from Thornton Terrace have been invited to ride on the Belle of Louisville, <laughs> she said, for the race. And she is thrilled to death. And I, she said she would wave to me. And I said, I'm going to tell the church. She said, are you going to church tomorrow? And I said, yes, I'm going to tell the church. And she said, well, I'll wave at all of them. Aww. So hopefully it will be on the news. Um, my nephew, Luke Hoskins, that I asked for prayer last week, he had his surgery on Monday, and they did end up amputating his uh, ring finger and uh, he's doing fine but I think it's just going to be an adjustment for him and so keep him in your prayers I got an email this week about um, the virus in Brazil is bad and they've closed down everything and so Corinne Smith asked that we keep them in our prayers there at the um, we, the camp and in town and everything. So, and then again, I guess you've heard. I heard from one of the missionaries that it's bad in India. They were packing to go back, and now it's on hold. So, India and Brazil both are experiencing a great deal of problems. So, would anyone else like to share this morning? Will you join me in prayer? God, we are just so thankful that you have brought us together for your glory. And as we come together this morning, there are many things on our hearts and minds. And so as we gather, we just ask that those things that are causing us distress, those things that are causing us to turn away or to look away from you or be distracted from what you're doing in this world, we pray that you would allow us to lay that at your feet and trust you with those things, to trust that you will guide us through all that we're going through. And all the things that may, maybe we didn't share this morning that are exciting and wonderful in our lives, I just pray that you would help us to acknowledge and give you the praise and the glory for those things. 
So Lord, I just ask that you would help to lead us into worship this morning, a worship that would continue after our time together, that would be a worship with our lives and with every beat of our heart, that we would actually follow you with our entire being. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now let us sing together the hymn, There is a Balm in Gilead. <laughs> yours. We thank you for the portion that you give us, for the blessings you share on us. We come, Father, at this time giving back a portion. We know it's never enough, but we hope that you would take it and bless it and use it to further your kingdom. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> Now let's sing together the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. Oh, 
Sing together, Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in. From its guilt and power, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou. Come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar.
Well, I've got some good news this morning. I am 99% sure we did not miss the rapture, and Randy will be back next week. And I'm going to talk to you today about an important subject, and it's an important spiritual discipline in the lives of a believer, and that's prayer. And I'm going to look at probably the most famous prayer in the Bible, and that's the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. And we're all familiar with, we repeat it in our services, we can probably quote it from the King James Version. But as I was studying this prayer, I observed some things that I hadn't noticed before. And the first was that this would make a really good sermon series. But I don't have five weeks to preach it, so we'll do it all in one sermon. And the second, Jesus being the master teacher, when he was teaching his disciples to pray, he used imagery that they would be familiar with, and he even threw in eschatology, or as we would commonly call that, the study of end times. But before Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he taught them how not to pray. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 5. And Jesus says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and we have shut your door, Pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now, Jesus isn't condemning public prayer here, because if he was, he would be condemning himself, because as we know, he regularly prayed in public. But what Jesus is merely saying is, if you don't have a private prayer life, you have no business going in public and making a show to impress other people. Jesus goes on and says... In verse 7, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore be not like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Some translations translate uh, vain repetitions as uh, empty phrases, or the NIV I think translates that, as keep on babbling like the heathen. And Jesus is making the point that we don't have to use a lot of words in prayer. In fact, he says, God knows what we have need of even before we ask him. So you might ask then, if God knows what we need, what is the point of prayer? And that's the last thing that I noticed as I was studying the Lord's Prayer, is that this Lord's Prayer or model of prayer, as I think it's better called, is it's really a focus. It's not something to repeat word for word but it's really a mindset and a focus of what we should focus on in prayer because the two examples he uses are very inwardly focused on ourselves and not on God. So Jesus, and another reason why we should pray is Jesus says in two verses three times, not if you pray, but when you pray. So we can come to the conclusion that Jesus expects his disciples to pray. And prayer is really just talking to God. You know, if I didn't talk to Michelle, but, you know, one day a week and for 20 seconds, you know, we probably wouldn't have a very good relationship. And prayer is our way of having that relationship with God. And it's not to change God's mind, but really, as the Lord prayer teaches, it's to change our will to his will. So now let's look at the Lord's prayer and see how we should focus on our our prayers. Jesus starts, therefore, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we see from the start that Jesus uses our Father. So Jesus isn't teaching unbelievers how to pray. He is teaching believers how to pray. And if you didn't have a good relationship with your Father, this might be a hard concept to grasp, calling God your heavenly Father. But the good news is, even if you don't have a great relationship with your earthly Father, We have a heavenly father who desires us to come to him, and he will always make time for us. And second, he says, hallowed be your name. Now, hallowed is, I would call it a biblical word. I was uh, shocked to find that most modern translations retain the word hallowed in this verse, but it merely means to set God apart as holy and to revere his name. 
Now, this isn't a concept that the Old Testament Jews would have been really great with. In fact, when I was doing my studying, I found 25 verses where God directly warns the Israelites, you shall not follow other gods. In fact, this is such an important concept to God that it made his top 10 list. But there were 35 examples that I found where they directly followed other gods. In fact, as Moses was getting the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, what did the Israelites do? They got impatient and they made a golden calf. They thought God had deserted them. They didn't hallow God's name. So how do we hallow God's name in our prayer? Well, first, notice that this prayer, it doesn't focus on ourselves. We don't rush to God and say, God, you know, give me A, B, and C. Now, there are times in our prayers where, you know, we need help and we just come to God and, you know, that's all we can do is squeak out, you know, God help me. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the bulk of our prayer life should be focused on God. And it starts out by focusing on the person that we're praying to. And really hallowing God's name, it's a, it's a lifestyle and a mindset. Because if you don't believe that God is all powerful, when you pray to God, do you think that he's really going to be happy when if you come to God and say, well, you know, I need a new car, but, you know, if you have time, I don't really think that you're going to provide that. You know, how do we think that makes God feel? You know, we need to realize that we're praying to the God that made the earth in six days, that created man from the dust of the ground and parted the Red Sea. James says that if anyone of you lacks wisdom, let him ask in faith and not wavering. Now, obviously, he's talking about knowledge there, but if you're asking God for knowledge, I'm going to assume that you're praying for it. And he wants us to come to him and recognize that he has that power, that he is holy, and we should live our lives recognizing that he is that awesome, powerful God. So as we start our prayer, I think Jesus is just telling us, focus on God, focus on his holiness, and focus on him and not ourselves. Jesus goes on and says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now here's where the eschatology comes in. Jesus came preaching a literal kingdom. And in fact, if you would have asked any of the Israelites in the Old Testament or in the time of Jesus what Jesus meant by your kingdom come, they would have thought he was talking about that throne of David that was promised in the Old Testament. In fact, 2 Kings 7, 12 through 16 says, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seat after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. Now, obviously, King David would have recognized that as meaning Solomon in the context but we know if we read the genealogy in Matthew 1, that that is ultimately going to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Daniel 2.44 says, And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break into pieces and consume all of these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And furthermore, Zechariah 14, 4 says that in that day, Jesus will stand on the Mount of Olives. And that is a literal prophecy that will happen in the millennial kingdom. But how does that apply in our lives today? You know, Jesus hasn't come back to set up that kingdom. Well, if you turn back probably just one page in your Bible to the start of Jesus' ministry, notice what he says. Chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to me, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When Jesus called his disciples, he didn't say, wait for my kingdom to come and follow me then. He desires his disciples to follow him now. Jesus is going to come back and reign on a throne, and it's going to be a theocracy, not a democracy. And he wants us to prepare for that by submitting to his life 
here and now. You know, the disciples didn't say, well, Jesus, when you come back, that's when I'm going to follow you. No, he expects us not two hours a week on Sunday to follow him. He expects us 168 hours a week to live for him and to shine his light. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. And it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And that's how we should be living our lives, recognizing that our lives are now not our own, that our lives are to glorify God and to bring glory to his kingdom. You know the old bumper stickers that were popular probably 20 years ago that says, Jesus is my co-pilot? Is anyone brave enough to admit that they had one of those? You know, but that's the opposite of what Jesus is asking us to do. He doesn't want to be our co-pilot. He wants to be flying the plane. And now you hear guys say, well, I'm the king of my castle. Well, I've got news for you. No, you're not because Jesus is coming back and he's going to be king. But in case you're wondering, I do put the pants on in my family. Michelle might tell me what pair to put on, but I, I do wear them. But he's desiring us to follow him now. And part of that includes your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, this again is, I think, prophecy because this will ultimately be fulfilled in that millennial kingdom. Because Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and it's also repeated in Hebrews, says that he will make a new covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel, and he will literally write his will into their hearts. But that doesn't mean that we come to God and say, my will be done now. We're asking for his will to be done now. Paul says, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. And did you know that Jesus prayed for the Father's will to be done? In Matthew 26, 38 through 39, this is days before, or it might be the day before Jesus is crucified. Jesus prays this to God. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That's amazing to me. Jesus, being both fully God and fully man, prayed God to take the cup from him, which was dying on a cross. But he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And this is our chance to come in prayer and to ask God, say, God, this life is no longer my own. I realize that I'm not living it for me, that I'm living it for you. And we have to depend on God for the strength to do his will and to basically reign in our lives because we can't do that on our own power. And could you imagine if more believers and more churches, instead of, you know, saying, well, you know, what color of carpet should we put in the sanctuary? Or, you know, we're focusing on ourselves, but we focus on God, his glory, and his kingdom. So the first two petitions we see are 100% focused on God and his dependence. So we come to God in prayer. We recognize that God is holy we recognize that God is coming back as king and we submit to his rule and his reign here and now. And only after that does Jesus say, give us this day our daily bread. Now, bread is something that the Israelites would have been very familiar with. Bread was a staple in their diet. And if you remember in Exodus, God fed manna, which is bread, to the Israelites you know, for 40 years. And God wants, you know, he wants to provide our needs. You know, he asks us to come to him daily and depend on him for the things that we need. You know, if I went home today, God could easily put $10 million in my house and I would never have to depend on him again. You know, I could just live my life and feed myself bread and pizza form every day. But that's not what God's desiring. He wants that daily dependence and recognition that God you are the provider of everything good, and all good gifts come from God. That We read that in James chapter 1, verse 7, and recognize and pray that, God, I need you. I need your help. Please provide for me. Now, this is important. God says that he will provide our needs, but not necessarily our greeds. 
I've been, you know, praying to God for years for a Sunburst 1962 Fender Precision Bass, but he says your 2011 Olympic wide is sufficient for you (laughs) because, you know, I, I don't need that. And still in this part of the prayer, even though we are focusing on our needs at this point, we're coming to the recognition that God, every perfect gift comes from you and you are the provider of all of these things. There's an interesting verse in Revelation 2, verse 17. And it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him. Now, this could be a reference to Jesus Christ, but I'm thinking out loud, and I haven't studied this, but maybe is God in the tribulation going to feed his people bread again? I I think that's very well possible. So we come to prayer, first, you know, submitting to God and his glory. We pray for his reign in our lives, and then we ask for our daily needs. And then Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, if you compare Matthew's version of the model prayer to Luke's, Luke uses the term forgive us our sins and not forgive us our debts. And this could be because Matthew, remember, was a tax collector. But let's take this as being forgive us our sins. Now, we need to realize at this point of where we are on the Bible timeline, because this is before Jesus dies on a cross. So the Jews were still offering sacrifices to atone for their sins. And we know now from Ephesians 1 verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So we are forgiven past, present, and future for every sin that we could ever uh, commit to God. But God still desires us to come to him, and this is our chance to say, God, cleanse me. Point out anything in my life, maybe it's a secret sin, it might be a sin that I know of, and say, God, I need you to take this from me. And sin is basically just separation from God and his will. And even though we're forgiven, this is our chance to recognize that God is the healer, that he is the cleanser, and that we need to restore fellowship with him. And the flip side of that is Jesus teaches us to forgive those who sin against us. And this can be a hard thing to do. You know, maybe we think that someone who sinned against us, that maybe they don't deserve forgiveness or they did something so terrible that, you know, we could never do that. Well, first, we need to recognize that, you know, we've done God worse than anyone has done us. But because God forgived us, we read in Ephesians 4.32, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. We forgive because Christ forgave us. And you know what it's going to take probably for you to forgive people who have sinned against you? God's power and God's grace. And this is our chance to come to him and recognize that, God, I can't do this apart from you. You are a gracious God. You are a powerful God. And give me that strength to forgive other people. Jesus goes on and says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I have heard people interpret this verse as being that God is the person who tempts us. I think the New Living Translation translate this a little more understandable. And it says, And let us not yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. And we know from James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one of you is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So we need to recognize that God isn't the one that tempts. Now Satan will tempt us, and that's where deliver us from the evil one comes in. But we all have triggers. You know, what tempts me might not tempt you. And we need to realize, you know, if we have a friend who leads us to do things that are outside of God's will, 
that maybe we shouldn't be hanging out with that friend or, you know, if maybe if you have a problem with alcohol, maybe stay away from bars. And this is our chance to come to God and say, God, I can't do this on my own. Give me the strength to withstand these temptations. So we come to God, we hallow God's name, we recognize his power and his glory, and then we pray for God's kingdom to come and for him to reign and rule in our lives and for his will to be done and not our own, recognizing we can only do that by his power and his strength. We then come to him and ask for our daily necessities, realizing that, God, this is all from you. We ask him to help us forgive others and recognizing that this is all, for his, that this is all through his strength. And then we end the prayer. So this whole prayer is focused on God and not ourselves. Even when we're asking God to provide us with our daily needs, we're focused on him as being that provider. And we end the Lord's Prayer, and Jesus says, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you have a King James, a New King James, or a modern English version, you're probably going to have this verse in the text. If you have an NIV, an ESV, or a modern version, this might be footnoted in your text. This is a textual variant, but I like this. It's in my version that I'm reading because it's sandwiched, focusing, starting the prayer on God, his rule, his reign, and his glory. And it's ending the prayer on God, his rule, his reign, and his glory. Now, I have a confession to make. I was convicted as I was studying the Lord's Prayer. And I was convicted because for the past probably four months, for whatever reason, I can't tell you why or the, you know, why or how, but when I pray in public, for some reason, I fumble my words. My mind knows what I want to say, but my mouth doesn't say it. In fact, in our deacon meetings, Tom McClellan generally opens us in prayer, and I volunteer to close us in prayer. And for the last four months, I feel like I've blown it, and I get embarrassed. And I've told Michelle and a friend of mine that, well, I blew another prayer. You know, I you know, embarrassed myself again. But you know what I realized? That that's actually a self-centered way of praying. I was focused on me and not on God. And that's the complete opposite of what this prayer is teaching us to do. It's teaching us to focus on our creator, his rule, his reign, his honor, and his glory. And you know, I could, when I end us in prayer here in a few minutes, I could totally botch this prayer. I could fumble my words and, you know, maybe everyone laughs, but you know what? That's not the point. The point is I am talking to my creator and it doesn't matter what I say. God knows my heart. God knows the words, you know, the Holy Spirit, when we don't know what to pray, will translate for us. And the point is, is just to come to our heavenly father, come to him in prayer and recognize God, you know, I need you in my life. I need your will in my life. I need your reign in my life and your power, because apart from God and his power, we are nothing. Apart from God and his grace and prayer, this sermon would have been nothing. And that's what really this model of prayer teaches us. It's a way to focus on God and not to change his mind, but to focus on changing our lives and our will to God's will. As we listen to this last song, if you need prayer, I'll be standing up front. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you are king, that you are sovereign, and that Jesus is coming back to right all the wrongs in this world. And God, we are thankful that you give us the power to do what we can't do with ourselves. And I just pray as we go about our week that we focus on submitting to your will, to your reign, and to your power and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Father God, as we go about our week, we pray that your will be done and not our own. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.